Cylinder reconditioning is an important part of restoring an engine to good operational condition. Reconditioning consists of inspection, measurement, and honing of the cylinder. If the cylinder is damaged, the reconditioning process includes the additional step of reboring the cylinder to a larger diameter. With the piston out of the engine, inspect the cylinder block. Look for areas of scuffing or scoring on the cylinder wall. Inspect the cylinder wall and block for signs of overheating. Hot spots in the cylinder can result in discolored areas on the cylinder wall. Severe overheating can cause valve seat inserts in the block to loosen. Next, check for nicks or grooves in the crankcase cover and cylinder head gasket surfaces. Inspect the exterior of the cylinder for cranks and chipped or broken cooling fins. Examine the head bolts and spark plug holes for damage or stripped threads. Depending on the extent of damage found, the engine block or cylinder head may need to be replaced. A Warren cylinder has a narrow ridge at the top. The bottom of this ridge shows where the rings stop near the top of the cylinder. Right below the ridge is the area of maximum wear, and this area is called the pocket. Wear here is caused by the lack of lubrication in this area, the diluting effect of raw gas on the engine oil, and pressure buildup behind the rings at their highest point. If the cylinder wall looks good, smooth and free of scuffs and score marks, the cylinder can be measured for maximum wear, taper, and out of roundness. There are several methods for measuring cylinders, but the common ones use a bore gauge, inside micrometer, or telescoping gauge. The use of these tools are covered by other YouTube videos. To measure a cylinder, first measure the cylinder just below the ridge. Make the first measurement in line with the crankshaft and the second 90 degrees to the crank. The difference between these two measurements is the out of roundness at this point. In other words, the cylinder is shaped like an egg. The second measurement is done in the middle of the cylinder and the out of roundness is found at this point. The last measurement is done at the bottom of the cylinder and the out of roundness is found at this point. Looking at all three out of round measurements, write down the largest of the three, and this is the cylinder's maximum out of roundness. Compare this to the specification, and if it's over the spec, the cylinder will have to be reconditioned. Taper is another important cylinder factor. Just below the ridge, the cylinder wears the greatest, while at the bottom of the cylinder, there is almost no wear. The bottom not wearing results because this area is well lubricated and only receives light pressure from the piston. To find cylinder taper, subtract the smallest cylinder bottom measurement from the largest top measurement and compare it to specifications. If it is out of spec, the cylinder will have to be reboard. There are different ways to repair a damaged or worn cylinder. Some aluminum cylinders are hard coated with chrome or nickel and cannot be rebored. Some have cast iron sleeves that can be easily removed and replaced. There are also some cylinders made of aluminum that have cast iron sleeve installed and other cylinders are made of cast iron. Many of small engines use unplated aluminum cylinders. Cast iron and unplated aluminum cylinders can be rebored. On small engines, cylinders are usually rebored in ten thousandths oversize increments, while motorcycles and cars are usually rebored in twenty thousandths increments. Oversized pistons must be used with rebored cylinders and will be marked with the oversizes on them. A boring machine is used to resize the bore. The bored cylinder will be straight and round, but does not leave good surface finish. After boring, the cylinder must be honed to the desired finish. The boring of cylinders is usually left to experienced machine shops. Honing uses abrasive stones to leave the cylinder with the correct finish. It is done after boring or if new rings are being installed. The purpose of honing is to leave the cylinder surface in a good condition that helps the rings break in. 
The hone puts cross-hatch scratches on the cylinder wall at a 45 degree angle. These fine scratches trap oil during ring break-in. Once the cylinder has been honed, it should be washed thoroughly in hot soapy water and lightly oiled to prevent rust. Crankshafts are exposed to tremendous forces while the engine is running. These forces lead to wear and damage that can cause engine failure. Inspecting the crankshaft and main bearings is an important step in engine reconditioning. Remove any installed bearings and inspect the crankshaft journals for discolorization, metal transfer, scoring, or wear. Discolorization is a sign of overheating, commonly caused by lack of lubrication. Scoring or metal transfer on more than one journal is also a sign of lack of lubrication. In some cases, light metal transfer can be cleaned up using fine emery cloth. In other cases, the crankshaft may have to be replaced or reconditioned by a machine shop. When polishing the journal, use only enough pressure to remove the transferred metal. Run your thumbnail over the entire journal surface. If there are any imperfections that catch your thumbnail, the crankshaft must be replaced or reconditioned. The machine shop will grind down and polish the journals to a smaller diameter and an undersized bearing must be used to maintain the proper clearances. Inspect any keyways on the crankshaft for damage. If there is any, the crankshaft must be replaced. Forces on the crankshaft cause the journals to wear out of round. Measuring the journals will determine if they are worn out of round or below factory specs. Measurements are taken at two points on each journal, 90 degrees apart. If any of the measurements are smaller than specs, or if there is any score marks, the crankshaft must be reconditioned or replaced. Engine main bearings may be plain, replaceable insert, cage needle, tapered roller, or ball bearings. Different types of bearings have different loading capacities. Some small engines may have one type of bearing on the PTO side and another type on the magneto side. Caged needle bearings, insert bearings, tapered roller bearings, and ball bearings should always be replaced. Plain bearings could be reconditioned, but is usually cost prohibitive. Caged needle bearings are used as main bearings on many two-stroke engines. They should be replaced any time the engine is overhauled. A bushing driver is usually used to remove and install them. Tapered roller bearings are usually used on larger small engines that are used under heavy loads. The outer race is usually in the crankcase cover, while the bearing is pressed onto the crankshaft. A bearing puller is used to remove the bearing, and the outer race is removed by pressing it out. The outer race and bearing must always be replaced as a match set. Ball bearings are used in many small engines, as well as motorcycles. It may be pressed onto the crankshaft, pressed into the crankcase cover, or held in place by a retainer. A bearing puller is used to remove one from the crankshaft, while a press is used if it is installed in the crankcase cover. In many small engines, the bearing surfaces are machined into the block and the crankcase cover. If there is any sign of metal transfer, scoring, or abrasive wear, the block or crankcase must be replaced. Replaceable insert bearings are used on cars, many motorcycles, and some small engines, and are easily replaced if damaged or worn. They are able to withstand heavy loads, but due to their large surface area and sliding action, they have more friction than ball or tapered roller bearings. When installing insert bearings, never lubricate the back side of the bearings, or the clearance between the crankshaft and the bearing will be too tight. Proper piston, ring, and rod condition are critical to proper engine operation. The condition of these parts are determined by inspecting them during disassembly of the engine. 
Any damage or excessive wear of these parts can result in low compression, blow-by, oil problems, and foul plugs. Because the piston expands due to the high temperatures inside an engine, they must have a specific amount of clearance between the piston and the cylinder wall. Different engines have different clearances, with 15 ten thousandths to three thousandths of an inch being a common range. Piston clearance is found by measuring the piston skirt diameter and subtracting that from the measured cylinder diameter. The piston should be measured 90 degrees to the pin bore and near the bottom of the skirt. After reboring and oversizing a cylinder, the piston clearance should be checked to ensure it is not too small. If it is too small, the piston can seize to the cylinder. To find the minimum piston clearance, subtract the measured piston diameter from the smallest cylinder measurement. If it's too small, the cylinder should be rehoned to the proper clearance. To find the maximum piston clearance, subtract the measured piston diameter from the largest cylinder measurement. If the clearance is too large, the cylinder will have to be rebored or replaced. The ring grooves must be inspected for carbon buildup, damage, and wear. Inspect all the ring grooves for carbon making sure the oil return holes in the oil ring groove are clear. Ring grooves can be cleaned with a tool that uses different size scrapers that are pulled around the grooves. A broken ring can also be used to clean the grooves. Piston rings must also have the correct amount of side clearance so they can move in and out of the grooves properly. Side clearance also provides space for lubrication and heat expansion. The side clearance is checked after cleaning the grooves. To check ring side clearance, place a new ring into the groove and measure the gap between the ring and the groove wall with a flat feeler gauge. If the side clearance is too large, the piston will need to be replaced. Piston pins are usually hollow and made of alloy steel, hardened and precision ground to fit the bearings. Most small engine piston pins fit snugly in the piston and are held in place by retainers. The retainers are usually formed spring steel that fit inside grooves in the piston. These types of retainers can be removed using a screwdriver or needle nose pliers. Once the retainers are out, the pin can be pushed out of the piston. If the piston pin is difficult to remove, a soft face hammer and wooden dowel can be used to tap out the pin. Some piston pins are press fit and must be removed by a press. Removing these types of pins are better left to professionals. Measure the outside diameter of the piston pin with a micrometer. If it is smaller than the specifications, it must be replaced. Now that the connecting rod is removed from the piston, inspect the connecting rod bearing and piston pin boss for scoring, metal transfer, or other damage. Check the connecting rod for any evidence of warpage or cracks. Replace the rod if any damage is found. If the rod appears to be good, the rod must be measured for wear and out of roundness conditions. The connecting rod big end is measured first by installing and torquing the rod cap to the rod making sure the cap is installed properly. Use a dial board gauge to first measure the rod in line with the connecting rod, then 90 degrees from the first measurement. The difference between the two measurements is the out of roundness. The largest measurement is the rod's wear size. If any of these is over specification, the rod must be replaced. The same procedure is used to measure the rod's piston pin bore.